All right, so welcome to Granlund Building Digital Twins webinar. Uh, my name is Tero Järvinen from Granlund, and I will be your host today in this session. Uh, I'm working in an innovation and development department, uh, and one big topic for me past years has been how to utilize building information models in facility management phase. As we all know, concept of digital twin is also part of this topic, but seems like discussions between construction sector and building owners are not always so easy. My colleague, uh, technology director, Dr. Science Kenduli, has done a digital twin study in cooperation with uh, Jose Compasano from La Peranta University of Technology. The concept of digital twin uh, in building sector has been here already a while, but seems like they haven't breaked through yet. Uh, for common use in operation buildings in their life cycle. In this study, Ken is investigating that matter. Why it seems to be so hard to take digital twins in real use. For my opinion, the study has many fresh thoughts about the current status of digital twins in building sector and offers more context to understand the complexity of concept of digital twins. Uh, please leave comments to create a box during the or or after the presentation. Uh, I will ask these questions from Mr. Dooley and Jose Compsano uh, when presentation ends. Uh, this rec webinar will be recorded and you will get a link to it after the presentations. Also, the link to digital twin study will be sent to all participants. So, without further introductions, let's welcome Ken Dooley and study of building digital twins. Okay, thanks, Tero. Thank you. Um, so, I guess the plan today is um, we'll we'll kind of go through the report, um, and I'm not going to go into massive detail today. I just really want to give people a feeling um, of what the content is and and if the if the if the kind of information is is relevant. Um, to, to start off then, I guess, um, the, the, the main kind of motivation for really kind of looking at, at digital twins um, is, is kind of noticing that maybe the, the kind of development of them wasn't as far along as we had expected a couple of years ago. Um, and one thing we noticed that, that we kind of, from speaking to other people, was that there was a feeling that BIM was the, was the, the the most important part of digital twins, that for buildings, building information models were an essential element. Um, and there was a feeling of, you know, we have this piece of technology, so, and it's wonderful, so kind of let's use it. Um, and it sounded like a kind of technology push uh, uh, approach, um, rather than actually, does this meet the needs of the, of the market? So we kind of set out to kind of really understand what were the, the needs of the market. Um, I'll show in a, in a moment some of the kind of people we were speaking to. Um, and then one of the other things that we kind of do in the report then is that, that Jose has provided a really good kind of grounding in the first few pages um, of where the research is as well. Um, and he's given a really detailed um, definition of digital twins for buildings as well. Um, in general, I keep a rather simple um, definition in the report and in my, main, in my mind, which is that there should be some up-to-date um, visual representation. It can be 3D, it can be 2D, um, and that visual representation or, or, or you know, digital replica is another word, um, that, that it should be embedded with static, but more, more importantly, with dynamic data, so with real-time data. And at that point, we really have something that comes close to um, a digital twin. And obviously, it can be much more complicated than that, but they're the basic um, elements in my mind. Um, one thing that we kind of started off the report with as well um, is we kind of come up with maybe some of the imperfections of the industry. Um, or some of the things that we have to accept before we move forward, which means that buildings are being changed more often um, than in the past. Even if a building opens um, in, Dece in December 2020, it's likely that there'll be big changes um, in small parts of the building, but still significant changes um, you know, within the next two or three years, um, or even one or two years. It can be 
um, a shopping center where you're knocking down walls and turning one space into, into smaller spaces. It can be adding toilets to an office building. It can be meeting room changes and these kind of things. Um, there's also um, a really clear understanding that the, the models or the drawings aren't updated to reflect these changes. Um, there's also a kind of really important thing is that um, when we have data and in that are, if, when we're trying to understand what's happening in buildings, it's much more intuitive if we can relate the information to the space where it's relating to. So if it says for some reason in this room, um, the temperature is actually only 13 degrees, um, and we think maybe someone left a window open or something like that, then a really important thing is kind of go, which room is that again? Um, why is the temperature sensor giving such a low reading? Um, and it really helps instead of having something on Excel to have something that's um, much more intuitive. Um, we're also talking as well about in point four here that the occupants and kind of customers of buildings are really important. Um, there's been a big focus in office buildings lately that um, the understanding that somewhere around 90% of the costs of a knowledge company are to do with staff um, and only 10% is related to rent and energy. So if we are coming up with innovations or new solutions in office buildings, then it does make sense if they're targeting the, the staff rather than just the operational efficiency. They're both important, but it gives more emphasis than before on the occupants and customers. And then there's also reality that uh, when as-built building information models are arriving um, at the end of a project, um, that they're really not as scalable or as ready to be used by um, to be used in a standard way as we'd like them to be. Um, I'll, I'll come on to this a little bit later on, but there's more work to be done on um, using as-built building information models in the kind of having the, the information or the operability or the integration with all different systems that we would expect from a, from a digital twin. Um, another example then, just to come back, and, and the timeline of what we're talking about really comes back from comes from Gartner in 2018 that said, we don't expect digital twin to be productive for five to 10 years. So, you know, that's, you know, three to seven years now, but it really tells that at this point in time, the, the kind of twin has dropped into this trough of disillusionment, meaning the people that were expecting it to help them and solve problems a couple of years ago um, are now disillusioned and they're frustrated. And this is something that we found in the interviews as well. I think in the report, to keep it simple, we've kind of said that maybe not five to 10 years, two years ago, we've kind of said that it's still three to five years away from kind of being a really productive, um, really efficient um, mass market solution. Um, again, when I said at the start that it felt like a technology push problem, so our approach in the research was to interview um, these kind of people, so a really wide stakeholder group, so developers and owners and investors, the renovation teams or anyone from a, you know, a contractor to an interior designer to, a, to, you know, to, to any of the engineering parts of, of renovation, um, asset managers, facility managers, um, other service providers like cleaning companies or security companies or receptionists, staff or um, restaurants. And then technology providers, which is mostly kind of equipment, could be IoT, could be elevators, um, could be anything like that. Um, and then the last is the occupants and customers. And it was really important to kind of go through uh, this wide range to really understand um, what, what were the needs of, of, of all these different relevant people. And we've explained this a little bit in more detail in the report. Um, and then a key thing with really what digital twins do um, is that they need to be seen as a technology enabler. Um, it isn't a piece of technology that does one thing. Um, the idea is that actually it can solve many, many problems um, uh, from a software or language point of view. There's many use cases that we can use, use them to solve, uh, but also, you know, the, they, there's many business cases I think we use in the report. So they need to be seen as something that's complicated, but it's kind of worth it um, because they, they, can, they can do a lot of things. Um, and what we came up with in the report when we looked at the different kind of problems people um, had um, and the kind of solutions that could solve those problems, we kind of said that on the right-hand side here, there's almost like a Power BI or, or business intelligence dashboard version of a digital twin, that maybe the financial 
investors are, would need where a really simple example is there's a lease expiring in a large building um, and the investors who own the building want to want to rent it out again and they might think okay what space is that again and by clicking the lease there's the information there about the price of the rent and who the current tenant is and these kind of things but it, it makes much more sense if that information could be linked to a floor plan that kind of shows which space is it is it on the second floor or is it in the corner or, or whatever it is um, and these guys were looking for digital twin solutions. They were looking for kind of um, information that could be connected to up-to-date um, drawings. The drawings currently weren't up-to-date. Um, it sounded like a kind of, it was, it was something a digital twin could provide, but they didn't need something as complicated um, as an as-built building information model. Um, so throughout the report, we kind of have discussed in detail these four kind of solution categories. Um, and I'll explain them a little bit more as we go through. Uh, but this is a kind of really big finding of the report um, that actually the the kind of Power BI dashboard or business information dashboard or or the the second one here, which is the uh, the two D kind of interactive floor plan or you know light really really light kind of wireframe three D interactive um, tool um, that they could even be considered as digital twins. That's something that the report. Um, maybe is controversially saying, um, but we've had good feedback from from um, from, from when we've said it uh, already in a, in a presentation recently. Um, but it's something maybe that wasn't assumed before that these two on the right would actually be considered as digital twins. Um, and I'll show throughout the presentation why I think we need to see them as digital twins. Um, so 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 I guess this is then the idea of why we need we need um, digital twins of this side now. The two on the right hand side through the report we've called them simple digital twins and the two on the left the kind of the building services or follow technique a digital twin and the as-built digital twin we're calling them complex um, digital twins and the reason why we need simple digital twins especially in the next kind of three to five years is really balancing um, the value that they can bring with how complicated they are and and when, when we talk about complexity in this context, we really talk about it as a kind of catch-all term for um, they're difficult to, uh, to, to build and create, they're difficult to maintain, um, and they're expensive to create and expensive to maintain. So complexity really kind of means difficult and expensive both in the setup costs and both um, in the kind of long-term maintenance. Um, and we, we have kind of really good quotes from, from the people we've interviewed that kind of give us, you know, aim from SS told us, you know, which makes loads of sense to me that we solve one problem at a time and kind of start iteratively. But at the same time, uh, Kimo has made really good comments saying, you know, if it's going to solve 500 use cases, then it makes sense for it to be this big, complicated, expensive, expensive di a difficult thing. But I guess for us, it's more the maturity of these kinds of things, the simple one versus the one that solves 500 use cases and really understanding at what point in time our digital twins that we're going to have um, at our disposable are going to meet that level um, of are be, going to be able to do that essentially so we kind of talk in the report about there being these different levels of value and complexity um, and we say in the report that we should really be aiming for this successful initial product or this successful mature product i'm not going to go into too much detail now um, and another point as well is, is just the root of how we do this. Um, do we go from um, iteratively from 2020 to 2022 and 2024 and go on these kind of technology sweet, sweet spots routes? Or do we actually say, let's not do a, an iterative buildup of, of, of complexity of the building information model. Maybe we should go to the top of the mountain, which is this all in approach. Um, Essentially, I joke sometimes it means locking yourself in a room for five years and coming out with this really complicated piece of technology that was really expensive to develop. Um, and this has been one of the, the kind of key elements um, that the digital twins that we've seen before are these big complicated 3D models that come from, from building information models. And you're not able to take an iterative approach because we already on day one of the building opening have this super complicated thing. Um, so we've kind of trying, we've been trying to say in the report that maybe taking a step back and having a Power BI dashboard or a 2D um, simple uh, digital twin solution might be the thing to do in the next couple of years. And we, we said this to our customers at a keynote I gave maybe six weeks ago now, 
um, and 180 people voted. Um, and in this presentation really advocated that they think people should start off with a simple version and continuously develop it over time. So of 180 people voting, 87 people said that. And it's difficult to start off with a really simple version if on day one you have an as-built or, or building services digital twin. Um, so we'll kind of come with how they fit together in the timeline as we go through and, and in the report as well. Um, and we've kind of gone through as well that we've, we've We've interviewed all the people, so there's 16 one-hour interviews, and we've come up with really kind of nice descriptions and details of the different business cases we've come up with, um, the as-built twins, the building services twins, the kind of interactive floor plan digital twins, and the business intelligent dashboard digital twins, so they're in the report. Um, and I guess one thing we're considering is really what is the kind of sweet spot solution that isn't just minimal viable product, um, that actually does um, balances value and complexity. It does enough um, to really warrant building it and, and, and solves enough business problems, but doesn't become really heavy and really difficult to create. And maybe it is this kind of 2D interactive floor plan um, and then that 2D interactive floor plan or really light interactive floor plan um, can be used as well in the, in the Power BI version. And then these are all the different kind of use cases. So this is kind of really clearly described in the report. Um, I can kind of show an example of it here as well for PowerPoint that kind of explains a little bit better that there are these use cases for, you know, the renovation team. It could be something as simple as, you know, the user interface for an interior designer. Um, for owners, it could be, you know, visualizing people flow. So they know actually how many people are visiting their building so they can kind of plan the rents. For asset or property managers, um, it can be to do with, you know, adding inspections or something as simple as that. For facility managers, it can be, you know, visualizing equipment locations. For the other people, it can be having a UI for the IoT providers. For the occupants, it could be about supporting indoor navigation or kind of finding spaces. And for the investors, like I've said in a moment ago, it's something like lease management. So this has the ability um, to be not really expensive to develop or set up, um, but also to kind of solve problems for multiple, multiple um, stakeholders and actually kind of, kind of really kind of have a lot of value built into it. Um, another thing in the report is we've come up with some kind of case studies or examples of things happening now. So we have some case studies from Skanska and um, with their as-built digital twin. There's two from Granlund and um, with the building services digital twins. Um, all the companies have written this text themselves so it isn't written by me and, and it's, it's kind of it's, it's their opinion of what they've done. We then have some kind of software products with the kind of interactive digital twin, um, the floor plan from Halt, from um, Rapal and Haltian and, and Steerpath. Um, and then we also have some, uh, you know, financial dashboards from Exquance and from Asepti. These guys haven't so much kind of connected, um, uh, let's say, the the floor plans in, uh, although although they have, but it, but it's something that they really have the ability to do. They've done a lot of the hard work, and maybe a future version of these is really making it easy to have this floor plan kind of built in, so the information becomes much more intuitive. But these are the kind of examples that um, could very easily uh, really improve if there was an up-to-date floor plan that someone else maintained and and gave it to. Um, Let's, so, you know, these three companies here could potentially give the floor plan to these. Um, and, and, then, and then these companies like, like Exquant or Asepi wouldn't be responsible for, for just creating the floor plan and updating it for themselves. So there's this central, central uh, let's say, geometry uh, floor plan. Um, and then throughout the report, what we've kind of done at the end then is we've tried to say um, the kind of things that we see coming down the line so the, the understanding that there's four different solution categories um, and the business cases raised and really the kind of relationship between the business cases that people have, people have requested and actually what the technology can do today has really come from the, the, the research. Um, the last kind of, I don't know, six, eight pages has kind of more come from um, our kind of ideas of what's coming in the future that really come from this research, but also lots of discussions that, have, that we've had over the last couple of years on digital twins 
and smart buildings and kind of user experience in buildings and, and these kind of things. Um, and I guess one thing is to just recognize that if we're working on big, um, complex digital twins like Grandland are with our building services digital twins, it's, it's just Grandland recognizing that, you know, in the next three to five years, which we use in the report, um, then, you know, it might still take those three to five years, hopefully shorter time to really get these building services digital twins um, used from after construction and when the building opens to be to be used really easily so that the data can be integrated in them from the BMS systems and other IoT and equipment systems that um, the information can be stored in them in a really scalable way so that um, every building is kind of done similarly and that it's it, it can be kind of used really quickly um, and also then that the complex use cases around things like augmented reality or virtual reality that they will catch up as well and that in the next maybe three to five years these simple digital twins will actually kind of solve some of the problems in the meantime when we're waiting for complex digital twins let's say to catch up so the sweet spot that we kind of talked about is this um, almost 2d version of a digital twin that solves enough problems that we've kind of shown in a moment um, and then the other problems that this sweet spot solution can't do really need 3D and around simulations and design automation and augmented reality and these kind of things. But there's a kind of a big jump in complexity to get to them. So before we get to that jump, then these simple digital twins can do a lot. But it's the recognition that these simple digital twins um, actually will tend to disrupt the complex digital twins in the next three to five years. So if you're just working on these heavy BIM based digital twins and not considering the other simpler versions, then, you, then you, some of the things that you, some of the kind of use cases or business cases or some of your customers' problems are probably going to be solved by the simple digital twins in the meantime. Um, and Granlund are really open minded about um, from a digital twin point of view or from a building user interface point of view as to what level of complexity kind of works. We'll continue to develop. Um, intensely the kind of BIM based digital twins but in the meantime we're really open-minded about um, having kind of 2D versions or having maybe information embedded in Power BI um, or these kind of solutions um, and just to know that these sweet spot digital twins the simple digital twins really fit the kind of textbook definition of, of disruptive innovation um, they really start at the kind of lower end um, of, of of the kind of performance, um, and they're not the kind of thing that the 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 high the people who are really expecting complex digital twins now who want to do simulations or want to do AR or VR um, uh, tasks uh, they really can't use these sim simple digital twins today. So there's this element of a kind of high end of the market and a low end of the market. The, the low end of the market is kind of the least profitable. Um, the, the, the cost of solving these problems isn't so much um, relative to the really high end of the market that would be around predictive maintenance or around things like, um, yeah, around like simulations. Um, and the thing is that the BIM-based digital twins don't really have a choice of which end of the market they, they arrive at. They arrive at this kind of high uh, product performance um, element and this is you know we, when we talk about disruptive innovation this is these complex um, heavy products start at this level but then the disruptors come a little bit later to the game and they start at a kind of lower level um, and compared to different kind of companies that might be disrupting a, a, an established company this is considered a really dangerous um, trajectory a really dangerous kind of business uh, business kind of a uh, model or or a way to kind of build your business. Um, traditionally in disruptive innovation, if some small company starts to um, nibble away or take some of your business, then that's really not a problem. But it is a problem if they start really small and they start to solve people's problems that you're not solving, and then they slowly, slowly grow and they start to compete with you over time. So these simple digital twins are really fit that box. So it's something that kind of anyone working on complex twins so real BIM-based twins need to be aware of and keep an eye on. Um, another example then is really just what will the kind of 
like almost the techno technological architecture or the, the kind of geometry sources be, will we see there be a 2D digital twin or 2D floor plan that will be updated? Um, and that will be used by the interactive floor plans and the Power BI. And then we'll be like simultaneously at the same time see a complex digital twin, um, which will be a 3D as built digital twin that will be updated over time. Um, obviously, until there's a really good business case for having the complex digital twin um, updated, there's just going to be the simple digital twin. But over time, when, when the technology matures and when the business model matures, um, then maybe we have this central master geometry, um, which, which is probably 3D, and then everyone kind of extracts the, the geometry or the floors or the location of the information um, from that central place. And for example, we have, we have Tommy Deco in the report saying that as someone that's working on these really light interactive floor plan digital twins, he has no problem with, um, for example, a, a BIM model could be the source of the other light models. Um, so this kind of needs to evolve over time as well, is if we have four different digital twin categories, do they have, um, are we updating the geometry? If, if a wall moves, um, if windows change, um, if, if we completely knock down um, certain parts of the building and, and do a renovation, are we updating the ge geometry four times? Or are we doing it on the top here, which is two times or eventually just once? This is something that we need to, um, there's a lot of uncertainty about it, it needs to evolve. Another thing then is the kind of, is the, is the revenue model. Um, there is a lot of discussion in our report as well on you know, who's gonna pay. If we do have this digital twin and if it is solving multiple people's problems, um, so it's, it's helping the cleaners um, plan their cleaning because they use it as, as their user interface for their cleaners. Um, it's helping the facility managers. Then actually, you know, if the building owner pays for it, then, then what do kind of they get for it? Um, it, from their customers. And we can kind of see as well, and Rico from NCC has kind of given some really good quotes as well, that basically if they build an as-built bu as um, digital twin from at the end of a construction project, then you know that really has a cost. Um, and they're not really being asked for it. And the customers and the building owners aren't willing to pay more for having a really good as-built bu building information model at the end of, a, of, end of the project. So, you know, there's no motivation for the constructors to, to build this perfect digital twin that's fully up to date, that maybe has the building uh, management system integrated with it, that maybe has the, I don't know, access control or different IOTs integrated with it. Um, and Rico even says that, you know, even if they were to, to build an as-built digital twin, they don't know what it's gonna be used for. They don't know what the building owner actually wants them to have. So there's this element of, um, you know, depending on the business cases, these digital twins require lots of extra thing and they should be done in a standard kind of scalable way to, you know, make them easy set up in the future, to make the learning curve of using them easy in the future. And paying for all of this right now, um, there isn't a clear kind of business case of if the owners pay for it, uh, what do they get in return? And we've given some examples in the report. And downstream of the owners, if the construction company are building these really good as-built twins, um, if they really build them, are they getting paid extra for that? Are they just doing it as, as a nice part of their projects, that good construction projects end up with an as-built building information model and it becomes best practice? Or can they do a really, really good job of integrating things and actually getting reimbursed for the costs? Um, so I guess one of the things that I've kind of alluded to and I've just kind of mentioned a few times is, you know, these simple digital twins may win a kind of battle of the next three to five years. They might be the things that grow fastest. Um, and then in the next five, to, in the five plus years, then, you know, these, these complex business cases need more development. Um, the digital twins in, like I've said, you know, the seamless use of BIM during the operations phase, the kind of business case of the different technologies. Um, and then the business model. And then I guess after five plus years, um, it's just really interesting to see what will happen. Um, one scenario is that, you know, the market position of these complex digital twins, these real BIM based digital twins will weaken in the coming years, uh, maybe in the next three to five years. Um, but actually, 
you know, if they become the master geometry model, like we, like we said, and that puts them in a really strong position, then they um, are kind of in charge of, of all the, the other use cases, and then they can share the data or the geometry with the other use cases if, if they need it, or maybe they can do it themselves. So, so they're in a really strong position there. Another scenario then, which I suppose is a bit more, um, is a bit more kind of pro simple digital twins, is that the simple digital twins will start off really simple, um, but then they, they will gather kind of knowledge and credibility and kind of customers and, and revenue. And this is why disruptive companies are, are dangerous and they'll, they'll add and add and add complexity as time goes on. And they might even end up as complex digital twins um, in five years time, but obviously from a very different perspective. Um, they won't come as a building information model um, uh, complex digital twin. They'll come from a company who really understands the, the simple and low value cases. They'll do them really, really well. Um, they'll get a reputation for doing them well. And then it's a matter of can they add the complex cases on top or are they so complicated, things like simulations, that only people from the kind of construction and design um, and real heavy facility management industry can do. So this is something we really don't know. Um, it's something we're, we've raised in the report um, and it's gonna be fun finding out, to be honest. Um, so that's the kind, of, the kind of main thing. For me, there's these four solutions um, and then there's this development timeline. And we've put a lot of detail in the report and hopefully this gives you a flow through of the kind of way we've covered the subject. Um, and Granada are really interested in, in the, all the stakeholders' needs. We're not wedded to any one kind of piece of technology. So that's something that, that we're really interested in kind of um, in learning with our customers um, over the years as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I think it's time for some questions. Um, and let's see if there's some online. Tero, are you still there? Yeah. I'm Tero, yeah. Thank you, Ken. Uh, really good presentation on half an hour huge package from about digital twins so so thank you for that so there is a question so, and um, and i will start with this one so this study uh, was done in finland uh, what do you think what's the situation with digital twins in other countries yeah really good question um we actually have spoken to a few people from overseas but but it is very finnish based um, and actually um, we in Groland have some cooperation with, for example, Microsoft in Seattle, um, with Sala, um, who's just changed her name. Sala Palas, I think it, um, she has a new surname, which I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and um, uh, they've been kind of really impressed by this approach and kind of how open-minded it is. Um, and we've had some really good feedback from them. And then as well in the UK, um, in the video I put on board, we're starting to see construction companies bring in kind of digitalization directors who maybe come from the software industry. Um, and they're starting to get a, a lot of power in companies like Granlund in the UK. There was a couple of guys from Horali I was speaking to, which are um, a, another big company, maybe slightly bigger than Granlund. And the kind of guys who are looking to, who are not from the construction industry and are more from software and technology, they're coming in and saying, that this is kind of what they think and they weren't some people weren't brave enough to say it let, let's say and i guess the thing that we're trying to be brave enough to say is that um that bim might hurt us more than it helps us for the next three to five years it may win the war it may be exactly the right place to be when the, when all of the maturity comes in and we have this monster that s solves lots of cases but we find that the rest of definitely in buildings globally from what we've discussed, and I know the global smart building um, market really well, um, definitely people are having the same problem. And it's some people coming from outside our industry that are starting to ask the same question. So I don't think there's any market really far ahead. Um, I think we're all starting to ask kind of these things around the same time. And, okay. and definitely you need to roll up your sleeves and speak to your customers, because I wouldn't have been brave enough to say this without it being a, a mandate from our customers what about you about think about a customer so who who is the customer when you are selling the digital twin environment uh, it's not just like the software it's also service so so who 
who wants to buy it? But well, okay, who's going to buy it and who is the customer? Two different, two different questions. Um, <laughs> but you know, this is why we compared it. This is why it's a technology enabler, um, and this is why it's really important to look at all the stakeholders. The customers um, are all those people we mentioned. Um, I, as an end user in a shopping center, and who wants who wants to use indoor navigation, or who wants to find a car parking space with an app or something like that. Um, I'm not paying for that solution, but it really helps me um, and it adds value to me. And then I'll return to that shopping center or something like that. So the customers need to be everyone because it's an enabler. Um, if we're just like a data platform, whatever that is, um, again, another myth of our industry still, um, just like a data platform, if it's going to be, if we're going to build it correctly, it needs it needs to solve every problem that's relevant to that building or that portfolio of buildings, um, and that's the same with this. Um, I guess from the question of who's going to pay for it, uh, in the report we give some examples of if a building owner pays for this, kind of what they get, um, and it might be even something really nice like you know the cleaners give them a, a discount, but if you have a digital twin gives us a ready-made user interface that we can plug into. There's a 10% discount or 5% discount in, in cleaning. It could even be that you have more transparency. So if you have a cleaning company using a smart cart and they're going around the building using, using your digital twin, then you can actually check, okay, what spaces did they clean today? Um, so we, we list a few of these in the report to give examples, um, but that's something that's really uncertain. And again, when who's going to pay is uncertain, the cheaper, less complicated values, less complicated things will sell their services quicker in the next few years. Um, if you want to sell a really expensive service and it is a kick-ass service, um, the business model is going to have to be more mature than we have already. So again, this is a timeline thing. This is a maturity thing. It isn't as simple as, um, as you know, who's going to pay, what problems are we solving? It's, it's a timeline. All right. So, so there is also questions about the hardware. So, uh, what will be the impact of the hardware, like IoT sensors in the digital twin? Uh, will those OAM develop their own platforms, like IoT platforms? Yeah. So manufacturers. So you know, let's let's talk about an ideal world here. In the ideal world here, someone comes up with a um, a floor plan, let's say, or a three D model. That is a that is a, a, a digital twin, and and those digital twin companies can have they can be they can be an IoT company, it can be someone else, but that someone has a business model that the building owner is paying them to have an up to date user interface. So it's an up to date interactive floor plan. Let's be simple for the next few years, and then anyone anyone serving that building can then use that as a third party um, for using that floor plan. So ideally, the IoT center companies don't need to develop digital twins, don't need to have their own platforms. The IoT companies will use the interactive floor plan. So let's, let's think, it's an office building. Um, Granlund are a tenant in this office building. The owner of the office building has um, some kind of simple digital twin service by Rapa or Halfian or Steerpath or whoever. And I, as an IoT provider, will just connect to that. And then that's my UI. Um, so ideally, um, some company will provide and the sensor companies are just one of the stakeholders that will take advantage of it. Um, okay. Really don't expect them to develop their own platforms, but, but let's see. All right. So the next question is from Joni Kamaran and from Here. So hi Ken, thanks for a good presentation. Uh, do you have reference cases uh, from which you could present the business model and value chain? Who is doing what and how the money flows. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, again, our use cases are really disconnected. So, um, I showed the sweet spot digital twin, the wheel there, and there was maybe twenty use cases. At the moment, there's there are um, maybe ten different companies with ten different solutions, all providing um, those those use cases. The point we're making today is that there should be a central geometry that all of those use case providers can tap into. Um, and then that makes their return on investment so much better. Because at the, at the moment, if you want to have a floor plan of a building as a user interface for your solution, 
Um, I know here I have, for example, navigation. So it could be even a, it could be even a campus um, drawing, or it could be and and then the buildings inside that campus. Um, if they want to focus on the actual navigation and the wayfinding, then they don't want to waste waste money on actually updating the drawings um, for the campus and the and inside the buildings. So someone else will do that and provide the use cases for them, and then they can concentrate on their their niche service um, and their return on investment should be better. So all of these use cases are kind of being done at the moment, just much less efficiently. And, and then that means that they're not being taken up by the mass market. And it means that maybe the geometry or the user interface is a little bit crappy because you have to pay for it. You have to build it 10 different times by 10 different companies. And maybe it can be a much nicer and intuitive and more beautiful solution if there's a central one that everyone else is using. Yeah. So a uh, question for Jose. Uh, Jose, uh, you are looking digital twins also from academic point of view. Uh, do you have opinion or maybe any research uh, topic who how much building sector is behind the example power plants or the manufacturing industry or are we behind uh, in construction sector thanks for the question uh well i wouldn't say that the building sector is falling behind i think the times are different it's just going on a, on a different timing uh, the concept of digital twin industry so we have uh, examples from years ago in manufacturing and production, but it just needs to be adapted. And I, that's what I would prefer to call this a different timing rather than falling behind. And it needs to be considered the different circumstances of the industry. And I think this report says it sets a good basis on what are the next steps that the built environment sector must take with these four different solutions. Uh, I think also from a research perspective, the fact that in this report we are combining angles also from software engineering, not only from construction side, uh, gives us a fresh new perspective on things. And perhaps these controversial statements, such as having digital twins that do not use BIM, that are just based on a dashboard, uh, open new opportunities for research and collaborations between industry and academia. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I think, well, let's ask Gwen again. Uh, when is the right time to develop a digital twin strategy? Um, yeah, as Jose is saying right now. So I was oh. going to say really, really, if you think your data for your building um, is more intuitive um, or the user experience of the people using your building is more intuitive by having it related to a floor plan or a 3D model and really importantly, one that's up to date and not an out of date PDF, um, then develop a digital twin strategy now. <laughs> okay. If, if I may add to that, yeah. that data that it's just sitting on a database or those models that are not being updated are lost opportunities. So that, that's why the reason to start a strategy is now. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, the a question, uh, well, I will ask it. I, I do not know the correct words here, but uh, yeah. What is the difference between digital thread or a digital twin? Yeah, I just googled what a digital thread yeah. means. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe um, I can take that one. Um, yeah, okay. Those terms have been used in some research uh, as synonyms in some cases. And in some other cases, the digital thread has been described as a characteristic or a component of digital twins. And the idea is that you have these thread or continuous connection between what's happening with, with the physical and the digital assets. Um, in this case, uh, I think both try to convey this idea that there is some synchronicity or that the changes in either one affect the other as well. So it's kind of a bi-directional. And that's why we consider also that even uh, a dashboard or a floor plan that reflects the current situation and the state of the building can fulfill the criterion of being a digital twin, even though there is no very detailed graphic representation in a BIM model, but this idea of the threat between the physical and digital is still present. I hope that clarifies the, the question. Short answer, okay. they are kind of synonyms, yeah. Yeah. And, and All right, so. One thing as well, on about yep. the connection between the real world and the, 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 virtual, the virtual version, 
in this report, what we're looking at, it's not a data economy report or how can data make your business better. It's about um, if you have data and things happening in your building, can having an up-to-date, let's say, user interface make things better? So this is about geometry. It's about, it's about it, we haven't kind of gone down the whole um, uh, of the rabbit hole of kind of data, data, data. It's, it's really focusing on, you know, up-to-date geometry. How can it make our services and our experience better? Um, and that's a key point in the report as well. Okay. So uh, it seems like we are, our time is ending now, right now. So uh, there's a couple of questions. Well, let's go a couple of minutes still. Uh, there is a question about the data security. So data security layers and cloud data, data hosting. Any insights with this? Yeah. Um, so at, at this point in time, we haven't gone into that level of detail. And it, that really echoes my point a moment ago. Um, the data is in a different box here. We're trying to highlight in this report if that data is, you know, if we can do more with that data by putting it in, onto a floor plan or a 3D model. And if so, how the hell do we get up to date floor plans and 3D models and how do we make this happen? Um, so, so we haven't focused on, on those things in this report. All right, so thank you, Jose and Ken. Uh, thank you for the uh, webinar and, and thank you for the study. So I, I have read the Building Digital Twin study already. And uh, at least for me, there is many new insights uh, to be found. So finally, a uh, study uh, which has like a business uh, point of view also, not only technical, technical specifications, and it creates good concept for my opinion around the digi Building Digital Things. So, Thank you all the participants uh, in this webinar and thank you Ken and thank you Jose. Good and I will link the report to, to, to my Twitter account and, and Grand will, will, will put it in their social media as well. Yes. Super. Thanks. All thank right. Thank you for having Thanks, me folks. today. Thank you.